the first module of this lecture is just uh, prerequisites on this uh, idea of neuroscience-based brain-computer interfaces. So um, fundamentally, uh, to be able to interpret uh, BCI models and to be able to interpret parameters of the BCI models, uh, you can interpret certain things like the time ranges of, of where things become relevant, but really where the most information is, is in the location of certain parameters uh, in the brain. <laughs> so uh, you need to be able to actually locate uh, parameters and then um, and thereby in a sense locate where the model assigns weight or importance um, in, in the brain of the person. Because we think you know, there's lots of information in, in the spatial distribution of where things are happening and so on. So that goes a long way towards interpretation. And of course, that's important if you want to know whether you're doing the right thing with, with your BCI. That can be done in, in various ways. So uh, one thing is if you have a spatial filter, there's techniques to calculate which zones in the brain they emphasize the most, where they have the highest gain, basically. What it requires is some sort of a forward mapping for the brain of the person that you're working with, or to use some kind of a general purpose forward model. There's toolboxes for that. So for example, the toolbox NFT has ways to, which is a plugin to eGLOP, has ways to calculate these kinds of forward mappings. And there's other work by other researchers, which is also useful for that. Um, there's another alternative way, and that is to, to directly represent your models in terms of components of the signal that are themselves localized or localizable. And one of these avenues is independent component analysis that I'll talk about a little bit. And the last uh, option is to um, basically represent models in a space of um, localized basis vectors. Um, you know, sort of a, don't restrict yourself to a small number of components, but instead cover the entire brain with patches of possible sources, and then find out which of these patches are being occupied by your model. So that's another alternative. Uh, now that is not necessarily the easiest one to, to get to work. So the easiest one, it turns out, is uh, a particular pathway that the Swartz Center has been um, spending years uh, on refining that. It's uh, the idea of using components of the signal and building your model on top of these components, uh, which are themselves localized. And this can be done by a combination of independent component analysis, which gives you functionally distinct and, and also spatially distinct components, and then fitting a dipole to each one. And that gives you the location. I show you quickly how that works. And also, just to um, connect to the previous stories that we've talked about, ICA is a method that gives you spatial filters. And um, th there's a matrix for that. And these, there's an associated inverse to the spatial filter matrix W here. Which, um, which can be, each of whose components can be localized because they are, say, dipoles or so. And what ICA does is it optimizes these, these weights such that the resulting time courses at the next layer are maximally independent over time. So that's, that's a fundamental idea. So it's a purely statistical criterion. Um, and it's somewhat surprising that it gives you these localizable components. There is a lot. Uh, I mean, a tre tremendous amount of information and material and documentation on this whole pathway uh, on the eGLAB website. So uh, you can read a lot of tutorials on this type of stuff. So um, th there's, there's lots of algorithms for this. And many of them are actually implemented in the toolbox. So the, the fastest reasonably good algorithm that we basically have is InfoMax. There's a faster one, it's FastICA, but it um, em empirically doesn't give as many usable components. Uh, here's a solution using Infomex. I you saw this before. Um, and what's actually not really um, clear in advance intuitively is why these things should have these kinds of dipolar, so basically biologically plausible, uh, spatially organized topographies, right? Because all you did is apply a statistical criterion based on the time courses. This method knows absolutely nothing about where the channels are located. And you know, it could learn completely scrambled weight maps, but it doesn't. Um, <laughs> and that's actually kind of surprising and probably one of the main um, yeah, you know, <laughs> interesting bits about this whole um, algorithm. 
And in any case, uh, you can learn um, or you can find the locations for these di uh, for these um, components with dipole fitting. And there's uh, tools in that. In BCR app, there's also a filter stage which does that. It's called dipole fitting. You basically just turn it on, and then it will fit dipoles. And the same pathway that can be used, of course, with other ICA methods. So the the empirically best one when it comes to mutual information reduction and so on is EMICA currently. Uh, however, this is currently a rather slow running um, thing. We are also working on making um, implementations of these algorithms which run on GPUs, graphics processing units, which are a lot faster, 10 times or 15 times as fast as, as the MATLAB implementation. So it can run in minutes. But in the current version of Toolbox, this is not yet included. And that um, takes us to the end of this, um, this pre-requisites module.